Hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Mixtape Podcast. I am Fatma Arif and my guest today is Uzma Aslam Khan. She is a Pakistani author who has so far written 5 novels and in today's podcast I get to talk to her about all of them. Uh welcome to the podcast Uzma. How are you doing? Thank you Fatma. I'm I'm doing well. I'm happy to talk to you again. Uh so um we have like a long uh, conversation ahead of us because I've decided ke we'll go through each of your books. Um so let's uh pehle before we do that let's start about how you decided to you know take up writing as a profession and w- one aspect of it that I'm really interested to ask is ke what was the reaction of your family because <laughs> honestly writing ya koi bhi art form or jo hai jo bhi koi decide karta hai to take up as a profession it's always a risky thing because is the wo financial security ka thoda sa bhi jo guarantee to khair i think covid has taught us ki kisi bhi cheez ki nahi hoti but they like wo jo hota na ki stable stability ke kuch dimensions and ideas jo uh, any society has and any culture has so usme anything pursuing on the art side is considered can't learn unless you are a hit it's always a risky thing right. so what was right. the reaction of your family when you decided yeah this is what you want to do ji so firstly just uh thank you again for inviting me and and for engaging with all my books it's a pleasure to actually go back and remember some of these early stories from when i first started so um The interest in writing was always there. I can never really remember a time when I wasn't writing in a journal. I used to have little notebooks and I would scribble. Uh it seems to me that I was always doing it. But yes, taking it up professionally is of course different and this didn't strike me as a possibility till I had written a first novel. Even though I had written a lot of smaller pieces before the first novel was completed, I really didn't ever think to submit anything for publication um i think partly uh, i doubted myself i didn't think i was good enough and i also didn't think that um i didn't want anything external to the writing like publishing looming over me you know i didn't want any goals i just wanted to to write and i think i was scared i was scared of the publishing world so i was and actually still am a very private person so i didn't show my work around um But then when I finished my first novel which is called The Story of Noble Rod in the mid 1990s um and I'll, I'll talk about that book next if you'd like but uh to come back to your question about my family's reaction well my mother was fine with it but my father did try to dissuade me um for financial reasons yes but I think you know at the time there weren't many english language writer pakistani writers like it, this was happening in india a bit more but it still was fairly new and there were the usual questions about writing in english so i think it was financial but also cultural mm-hmm. and i think that you know along with that cultural question of language there was also a gender bias frankly mm-hmm. um men like tariq ali and zulfikar mm-hmm. ghosh had been writing in english but that was okay when i announced that this is what i wanted to do or rather that there, it wasn't a choice but something i had to do something i was doing and and had to continue doing then i think things like honor came into the question um you know there there was the fear of where well, what could i possibly have to say right what could a young woman possibly have to say um we're not we're not born with intellectual authority or cultural authority so there's there's a lot of doubt put on our shoulders um and then like you said unless it's a big hit so there was the 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 need for it to be a big hit what if i didn't get good reviews what if the reviews were bad what if you know what if the family was shamed i think that was that was definitely a, a, an issue um and this probably contributed to my not showing what i had written to anybody because i was really uh i was made to doubt um but then once it was published and got good reviews and that first book you know was published in india um then 
there was parental pride. So things changed. And then there was, then it was like, oh, there's a book launch. Let's go to the book launch, tell your friends. But other people had to praise the book first. first yeah. Yeah. I think that that's something that I think it's a cultural thing that everyone I think has experienced. Uh, so talking about your first book and you'll have to, uh, I think, do more, most of the talking here because this is the only book that I have yet not read of yours, uh, The Story of Noble Rod. So just uh, talk about how you, the topic that you picked for this book, how you decided to do that and what was your first publishing experience? Uh, I have like read one of some interview of yours. I can't place where exactly where you have actually highlighted that, you know, uh, this publishing pressure that that they see writers have, uh, you know, of having to, there is sort of an, and sort of at times said and at times not said, understanding that you're supposed to write about our culture in a set way that presents a specific picture to the Western world. And you have always tried to sort of resist that sort of, uh, you know, stereotypical uh, form of writing. So just share how you decided on the topic and what was your first publishing experience? Okay. So the first novel, The Story of Noble Rot, uh, was completed in the mid 1990s, as I said. I was living in Rabat in Morocco mm. at the time. Um, the book is, it's about two women. Uh, one is married into a wealthy family and one is a poor woman. Um, it's a quirky book full of magic and myth. You know, I, it, it's a, it's a lot of people have said it's very different from my other works and I kind of see where they're coming from, although there are magical elements in a lot of my books. Yeah. So I think that interest was always there. You know, my daddy's house in model town Lahore was definitely haunted. And <laughs> I spent a lot of time in that house as a child. And my pupos used to tell stories of gins and churels late into the night. And all the, the women and the girls, we used to sleep together in a row of beds in one long room. I remember that room so well. It was a really long room with high ceilings. And I was always, uh, you know, somebody who didn't sleep very well. So I would, I would lie awake at night listening to their gossip and their stories and bats would be flitting around the high ceilings. Yeah. And to this day, I love bats. I just have <laughs> this fascination with them. And they, they told stories of women with feet pointed backwards. And, you know, they, they said that they were there in model town. And so a version of today, this today's story, I made its way into my first book. And I guess it's not surprising because it was, mm. you know, I was carrying these stories. Mm. And, um, yeah, so those late night uh, stories and, you know, gossips between my purpose. They, I think they also taught me about my family's history and the poverty of my father's youth. Um, though he rarely spoke of it, his sisters talked. And maybe in part because of this, the story of Noble Rot became a book about class differences in Shredeos. I mean, there's so much we don't talk about in Pakistan and and, you know, uh, financial struggle is, is one of those issues. Yeah. So the book took for in terms of just um, how it began, I don't really, I never know. I mean, it always begins with an image. And in, in this case, I just had a really strong image of a carpenter in a shop being bullied by a rich woman who was just dismissing everything he was making and, uh, you know, insisting and, and bargaining so hard that, you know, he was, he, he had to keep remaking the, the, the furniture. Um, and that's actually how it began. And Malika is, is the, the woman who then comes into conflict with the rich woman coming into the park, uh, carpenter's shop. So it's, a, it's about a woman who's married to a carpenter and a, a woman who's um, sort of bullying this family. And that the conflict is between them. And then, like I said, there's a lot of magical elements. So to come to your question about publishing the book, I'm a very slow writer. So this book took four years to complete. And then it took at least as long to find a publisher. 
Um, you know, these days you hear a lot about first books getting picked up immediately with big advances and making a big splash. And these are the kind of stories that people love to hear and people think, oh, I, I want to be a writer, for, you know, because it's, it's just a celebrity life. But that's not a writer's life. A writer's life is full of rejection and heartbreak. And this, I think, I wish this was acknowledged more often. Um, and it, I, in Morocco, when I completed this book, I, back then we didn't have uh, internet or, you know, you didn't have resources online. So I, I had a, 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 some man, I found some journal which had a listing of agents because I had heard that the way to, the best way to get a publisher is to get an agent. And I, I got an, uh, I now have a, a, an agent I'm very happy with, but before then I had an agent um, for a very short time who read the book and she said, you know, it's a very desi, she didn't use the word desi, but she, she meant that it's sort of, uh, it's not going to appeal to a Western audience. It's about class and it's about two Pakistani women and she said, you need a bridge character. These were her exact words. You need a bridge character. And she said, you need a Jemima Khan-like character. So basically a white woman, a British white woman who would, you know, be the, the one that readers in the West could relate to because readers in the West won't relate to brown women. And this is the sort of... Uh, it's still happening, Fatima. I mean, these are the kinds of ways in which I think writers from the global south really, isn't especially women, are still up against a lot of pressure to to bring our stories to them because they cannot bring come to us. And this that they, you know, us and them divide. It's it's not being created by writers, right? It's being created by the industry. I mean, I have said often in my interviews that I grew up reading literature from all over the world. And I remember reading Tess by Thomas Hardy, uh, which is about a, a poor woman in the country. Um, and there was never a part of me that thought, well, she's white, she's English. I, I don't know what it's like being an, a white English woman in the countryside. I cannot understand the story. I cannot relate to it. I never had those thoughts. I was so smitten by the character and the setting and the writing and the beauty of the, the tragedy, you know, it never occurred to me. So this idea that, that it can only happen in one direction and it cannot happen mutually, I think is false. And so I, I completely, I was not going to rewrite the book. Um, so that, that relationship was over <laughs> very quickly. And then I submitted the book directly to Penguin India. And I remember um, that I was, I remember that I, I received, a. Uh, by then we had email, because I remember that um, I received the email from Penguin India and right on New Year's Eve of two, so 1999, December 31st. And the editor Karthika, you know, said she had opened my envelope and she read the story and she wanted to publish it. And it was just a delightful New Year's present. And she is still, by the way, five books on, bless her, the one who publishes me first. Yeah, I, uh, you know, the specific thing that you talked about that, you know, we have read, uh, when we read books written by, you know, Western authors, we sort of don't really uh, have this idea that, oh, we can't connect with these characters because, you know, we, we are not white. I think this protection of, of the Western people by the, their industries is sort of the thing, is, sort of contributes to many of the dumb things we get to hear or you know, see from them from when they wonder why, how we can speak such good English. I mean, you colonized right. us, what were you expecting? And then, you know, right. we knowing about their culture more, be it, you know, we, pop culture and they're being shocked about it so I think that that sort of you know is industries be it specifically entertainment industry you know sort of putting out that protective uh, layer around those the viewers that you know they they can't they won't be able to connect or dumbing thinking that they are so dumb is something that's problematic and hopefully it will change with uh, a lot of more communication tools that we have now 
Um, so uh, let's move on to trespassing, which I have read. And so in trespassing, um, you have sort of uh, highlighted, you know, the political violence that Karachi came to be associated with in a specific period, specifically in the in the 90s and early 2000s as well. And you, it also has this uh, the story, I'm not going to give uh, any of the storylines in really detail, but just touch the, you know, the basic. It also sort of highlights, you know, the traditional demands uh, that a society puts on uh, individuals that not only impact individuals, but I think can sort of, you know, linger on into other, you know, other generations as well. Uh, decisions and consequences of events in one generation can lead up to uh, other generations, you know, adding to the generational trauma that, again, I don't think it's a recognized uh, idea in in our society. We are just starting out to uh, talking about mental health. So I think it's going to take time before we get into this sort of uh, issues as well. Uh, so just um, talk about how um, you were able to, you know, get into that Karachi landscape where you're living here, or was it something that you picked up from the news clippings? And also specifically, where did the idea of adding that, you know, the, the important feature of silkworms and the whole, you know, uh, portraying all the, the silkworm farming, uh, and you, you, all, you connected that to a very historical aspect of our inspiration. Uh, because fashion designers may, when we talk about it, it's mostly People say, oh, you know, uh, specifically a criticism that our current fashion designers get is, you know, they are so inspired from the Western culture and they try to copy and put, but you picked up the idea of a, this businesswoman taking up silkworm farming and taking inspiration from her old uh, cultural uh, history. So where did that research or that idea came about? So go okay. ahead. Okay. <laughs> So just in terms of, um, you know, Karachi and, and the writing about Karachi. So yeah. I, I do think that uh, it's the second novel, Trespassing, that was consciously set in the 1980s and yeah. 90s. And by consciously, I just mean that I started really thinking about my own um, time in Karachi. So I, I lived in, I grew up in Karachi during this period. Uh, and it was, you know, under General Zia during the Afghan war and its violent aftermath, which of, of course still ongoing. And Trespassing's protagonist, Bia, is the child of a kidnapped father. That's not giving away too much for those yeah. who haven't read it because you find that out fairly quickly. Yeah. And I, there was a kidnapping in my family during this period. Um, and then her story is interwoven with that of a, a Sindhi boy from a fishing village, Salamat, yeah. who experiences racism in Karachi and joins an armed nationalist struggle. And during this period, actually, um, I would say in the early 90s, one summer, I worked for a very brief period for Herald magazine where I interviewed some Sindhi nationalists and maybe this was all percolating you know mm -hmm. the, the mind just holds mm -hmm. body and more than yeah. the mind the body holds so much and so at some point I suppose these threads um, became interwoven with that of another character Danish who's a student of journalism who experiences racism in America and is censored when he writes about the 1991 Gulf War. And I don't really know my conscious thought process behind mm -hmm. all of this. I don't write with a plot or an outline. I just kind of feel my way through each book. And maybe that's why it takes so long. The language has to come to you through images, through embodying each character. Um, and with trespassing, the image of Dia in a tree came to me one day. And it may be because I spent a lot of time in a tree in my grandparents' house. I don't really know, you know, later when you're done, you start looking back and thinking, well, maybe that was it, maybe that was it, but we don't really know what it was. It's just that the image came to me one day, just like the image of Danish driving to and from the airport with his father in Karachi. These two images were some of the early ones that began this book. 
um, and, and they kept returning to me. So I just began to follow them in writing. Um, and then the, the, the third you know, major character in this book, Salamat, um, the image of him watching a turtle lay an egg in, in his fishing village, which is outside Karachi, that, I, that is now, of course, the first scene in, in the book, it's in the prologue. Um, so at some point, these, these three, their stories started interweaving in, in ways that were very exciting to me. And, and in terms specifically to your question of silkworms, yeah, that is a very fun part of this book. I mean, I was growing interested in traditional textiles, as you said, dyes and designs, and in particular silk. Um, it, it was probably, you know, I must have read something about natural dyeing. I know, you know, Noor Jahan Bilgrami in Karachi, mm -hmm. sort of one of the pioneers of this. And, and I had read about her. And in fact, I told her some years ago that I think, you know, my book Trespassing mm -hmm. might have in part been inspired by the work that you've been doing. And, and she said, really? And I said, yeah. Um, and, and maybe I also, I know I did come across a silkworm rearing for an article on silkworm rearing in Pakistan mm -hmm. and and then I you know I started linking these threads right and and then once I knew silkworms belong in the story then I read up more and more on silkworm mm -hmm. farming and I've always been as you know just very I feel very connected to the natural world and the physical mm -hmm. world is very alive and fascinating and I guess I'm an amateur naturalist I spend a lot of time observing small, small happenings. Um, and, and then I also visited silkworm, silk factories. And then most enjoyable of all, I kept some silk uh, worm cocoons in my room. And by then I was living in Lahore. Mm -hmm. So after Morocco, after the story of Noble Rot, um, while I was waiting to publish that book, I started trespassing also in Morocco, but then I completed it in Lahore and while writing these scenes, I was in Lahore and someone I know worked at Changamanga Forest, which is just outside Lahore. And she brought me those cocoons. So most of what Dia sees in the book, I myself observed close up. And there's a scene where, you know, the cocoons move and yeah. they do move. I actually, yeah. you know, this is, quite creepy. I don't know how they know they're being watched, but I, I was teaching at the time and I was living in a very small two bedroom um, apartment on campus. Mm -hmm. And I would leave the, the room in the morning and, and I would put the cocoons on the table. And then when I would come back, they were not there. And there, nobody else had access to that room except my husband who was also at work. So nobody had, had moved them they moved themselves and that, and they always rolled to the back of the TV, which was the coolest and darkest mm -hmm. corner of the room. That's where we would find them. So that's really wild <laughs> that I got to see this happening. Um, and then the, you know, it's, it's, they have a consciousness. They, they know they like, and I actually, at that point, I remember describing to one interviewer that the whole making of this book was kind of, you know, like I was weaving my own yeah, cocoon yeah. and that I had to do it in private, just like the cocoons had to do it in private without being watched. Like you can't, you can't be watched when you're writing. And I felt, I felt like I was just in the secret cocoon where I was building something and I didn't want to show it to anybody. And, and it was a very delicious time of my life where it was just me and, and the writing. Um, but those cocoons, at one point, I realized too that, you know, they stained my table. Like they were leaking this liquid, just like the seeds in the book. And, and then one morning I woke up and there was a moth on top of it. Was, so it had hatched and it was so beautiful. And um, in fact, I know this is a podcast, so you won't be able to show the image, but um, I think on Facebook and Instagram, I do have an image of the moth that actually hatched. And uh, uh, if, you, if you can share it with me, I will we'll put it on uh, Mixtapes, Instagram uh, and Facebook separately okay. when, when we, uh, you know, uh, okay, post I'll the send podcast. It it's, a very, it's, it's a sketch that my husband drew because he draws better than I do. And it, you know, the, 
it, and I found it recently because I had put everything in storage in my mother's house in Karachi and I opened this box and there was the sketch and it just brought us back to that glorious morning when the moth, this beautiful moth was just sitting on top of a cocoon that had leaked all this liquid. Um, and, and it was, uh, I don't know, it is, it's, it's just, it was like a blessing really that, that whole, the whole way that the, the cocoon story and the silk story and all these threads interwove in my own consciousness or subconsciousness, wherever the writing happens. And then of course on the pages, because um, threads are also physically present in the book. Since yeah. Dia's mother, Rifat, is the silkworm farmer that I had been writing all along without really knowing it. Yeah, so I think those of uh, our listeners who have read the book and those who will decide to read it, when they go through, through those parts, they will now, then, uh, for, for example, myself, it's, I, this was something that I, when I, while I was reading, I was figuring out that how could you, you know, you, I know if you are writing fiction, if somebody wants to write about the specific topics, specifically scientific related, you can do research and then yes, if you really do some in-depth research, you can translate it into some imagery, but the sort of, the level of imagery that goes around the entire, you know, the weaving process and the silk worm farming process, obviously now that you have shared the story, you, you actually, I can relate how, why it was so easy for you to, you know, give, give that imagery through uh, your words because you actually experienced it. Um, so yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, so yeah, you said that, you know, this was one of the books that, you know, was sort of based around the Journal Zia uh, yeah. era. And the next book that we are going to discuss is also uh, something that reflects that era uh, and a period in Pakistan where, you know, there was, there's been a lot of struggle uh, of this idea that, you know, the scientific world and the religious uh, world uh, narratives are not really compatible and things that sort of are to some extent to our generation who was not even there then uh, is sort of facing the consequences and that book is the geometry of God um, so yeah uh, that uh, again um, I will let you sort of uh, share again without giving uh, too many spoilers about how you know sort of uh, went about the characters you know the two sisters the grandfather and all that you know uh, the storyline as much as you think you would want to share without you know spoiling it for anybody who is who hasn't read it and again um, in the previous book like we discussed it was the silkworms in this book uh, as you all already have mentioned that you, you have a personal interest in nature and you know different aspects of it uh, in this book, uh, the central theme or the central, you know, sort of in, in natural aspect you picked was uh, one of uh, the salt range area was the key focus and the archaeological uh, diggings that happened. Uh, and something, and some of we, I think now people do relate to salt range, but it's more from a tourist point of view because there's a salt mine that you can go visit and a couple of uh, small lake that people have picked up recently as a picnic spot or a short hiking spot. Uh, but the aspect that you uh, get into of you know, a young girl discovering, making a discovery that makes it to international news but sort of creates havoc in, in the local uh, news or the local environment. So uh, whatever you want to share about it. Yeah, so yeah, The Geometry of God, this third novel. So I mentioned before that I moved from Morocco to back to Pakistan and, and I was living in Lahore. And, and so this trespassing, you know, was completed in Lahore and The Geometry of God was begun and completed in Lahore. So this book um, was, I feel that if trespassing was the 1980s, Zia's, time, you know, the fallout of the Afghan war and the beginning of the Gulf war. Um, this book was very much a post Zia 1990s yeah. book, not 1980s book. And it was really the, the damage of, yeah. of the Zia era um, is where I, I landed with this book. Mm -hmm. And 
unlike Trespassing and also the story of Noble Rod, this book actually began with a voice, not an image, and it was Amal's voice. Mm -hmm. And um, fr I just kept hearing her and I, I don't really know, it was new for me to write in first person, right? The first two books were in third person. I had never used the, the word I in a novel before. And maybe that's something that we are discouraged from doing in Pakistan mm -hmm. is that a lot of the books that we write, they are, uh, or read or taught are third person novels. Um, but this novel unfolded in the in first person and it was through the voices first of Amal, then Mavish and then Noman. And the book is told in all three points of view and, and they're very different voices. And then as the book evolved, you know, the relationship of these characters and, and, their, and it, that is what, what really kind of, it's a character driven book, I feel that. Um, and, and so, I mean, I suppose they all are, but this one, just because it was written in first person and there's a lot of humor that, that was allowed to me because it was so direct and intimate and it's also present tense. So there was a real immediacy to this book. Um, in terms of the language, yeah, just to go back, I mean, in terms of the landscape, just to go back to what I was saying earlier, this book was written entirely in Lahore and actually it's the only novel I've ever written while living in one place because I've moved so much and my books have moved with me. But this book was begun and completed there in the same house uh, and it's entirely set in the Punjab. So it begins in Islamabad where the fa Amal's family is living and then they move to Lahore and then it moves into the Salt Range, as mm -hmm. you said. And I would frequently, again, it was experienced because I would frequently pass the Salt Range on my way to Islamabad. We used to go from Lahore to Islamabad often because I had a, an aunt living there that I was very close to. And so we would drive on the motorway and and pass these beautiful uh, hills and, and often get out and just walk around. Um, and I would always want to do that because the natural world just is a living vital presence in all my books and people are just one component of it. And we are connected to everything around us, not only people. So when I would walk in the salt range, I'd notice fossils scattered everywhere and I'd walk around and pick them up and try to read them. Um, much like Nana would come to teach Amal, you know, to read them in the book very early on, that's, that's, the, that's the opening is him trying to teach a young Amal to read these rocks. And, and then while I, so I think that's, that's really just Amal trying to learn this other language, the language not of, of humans, but the language of rocks, the language of mountains, the language of soil, the language of, you know, seas. Um, that's really maybe what propelled me. And then while I was living there, I, I also came across in uh, the newspaper about fossil discoveries that were happening in Pakistan. And, um, and I was, fascinated. They would get these full page spreads about, you know, fossil discoveries. And, and it was some of them were in, in the salt range. And of course, Baki Setas, the first whale fossil ever found was in the salt range, so close to where I was living and, and, and where I would pass on my way to Islamabad. And, and I, I just thought that this was kind of meant to be, I was supposed to be here coming across these stories in the paper while writing this book about Amal who's trying to read these rocks. Um, and then I got very fascinated by whale evolution and I started reading up more on that. And, and you know, whales evolved on land, not water. And that's amazing. And so the book began to incorporate really playful versions of the different drawings that I found of what this amazing animal might have looked like all those years ago. And you know, when I was, one of the first books I read uh, when I was a child that really moved me was The Little Prince by um, Antoine Saint-Exupéry. And I, that book had drawings in it. And, and I remember telling myself when I was writing in my secret journal, long before any books were written, that one day I want to write a book with drawings in it. 
And, and so this book, you know, when I came across all these funny pictures of, of what ancient whales looked like, uh, I started drawing them. And, and so Amal starts, you know, drawing mm -hmm. the dog whale and, and making all these drawings that I incorporated into the book. Um, and so that's how that came about. And like I said, I do think it's the funniest book I've, I've written. Of course, there's a, there's sorrow too. Nana's story still tugs what happens to him. Um, and then Mavish's scenes are maybe especially rewarding of all the characters mm -hmm. I wrote in this book. It's Mavish who is blind. Mm -hmm. So Mavish and Amal are sisters for those who haven't read it. And you know, what the day that Amal makes this discovery of the first whale fossil ever found, um, that's also the day she discovers that Mavish is blinded and because she's a, a girl, you know, she, mm -hmm. instead of nurturing this uh, interest in developing her, you know, her, her profession, she's asked to look after Mavish. And so that becomes her job is looking after Mavish. And so there's some conflict between the sisters, even though there's a lot of love between them. Mm -hmm. And, and Mavish, uh, Amal teaches Mavish a language, just like Nana taught oh. Amal a language. Oh. And then Mavish has to learn how to read. Um, and, and so she develops a very tactile language, which is actually what fossil reading also is because mm -hmm. you, touch, you touch the stones, right? And, you, and I'm very tactile. I really like, I think of all the mm -hmm. senses I, I do use this one a lot. I need to pick things up and touch them just like I was doing when I would walk in the salt range and pick up the stones and actually turn them over and, and try to figure out how the pieces fit together. Um, it's, it's very sculptural. And, and so that whole process of Mavish coming to her own language through touch, through learning Braille, and also through her own drawings because she would draw um, and through Amal drawing on her back to teach her letters through touch, you know, when she would bathe her. Um, it, it just all started evolving very naturally in, in the book. And, and Amal tells her that a language is like a wheel. It comes from something else. Yeah. And so this allows a lot of room and fluidity for wordplay in the book. And, and it's Mavish's ability to adapt that allows her to become in many ways the soul of this book, I think. Her wordplay, her puns, her drawings, her mischief. Um, you know, her own private listening yeah. to the Azan. There's a scene where she's, you know, just sort of her own imagination is so vivid and alive and, and, and ever present. And so the book has her zot, I feel. It's, it's her in some ways that's carrying the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you, uh, yeah the book is, is like, yes, it does uh, deal with one of, you know, a bigger macro level uh, political conversation, but as you said, you know, those individual conversations is something that I really uh, enjoyed uh, in this book. Um, so yeah, moving on to your next book, um, which is a love story. Uh, comparatively, uh, I think a bit different, not really a lot of, uh, I won't say it's like starkly different from uh, your other works, but yes, it's a love story, but not a typical love story. It's a love story of uh, two people who are individually, you know, struggling for to look find their own identity. Um, which sort of uh, what I really found interesting in the, uh, in this uh, thinner than skin was that through these individuals, it sort of also was sort of I would say, uh, you know, I don't want to for lack of a better word, a double layered conversation where, you know, when you talked about, you know, looking for your identity, it was also for the fact that the country is also, you know, figuring out its identity specifically when it comes to uh, indigenous people, uh, specifically, uh, of, uh, again, uh, as every uh, book has a different aspect of, uh, you know, nature associated with it. Thinner than skin was, you know, uh, had was mapped around our mountain ranges, which are world famous for their beauty and you know their their scenic beauty and the sort of tourism 
if you're trying to, the current government is trying to promote it to all, everybody, they're telling the rest of the world, you know, we have amazing mountains. But yeah. you actually, but uh, in my own experience as well, uh, this is what I found that a lot of people are not really too keen or interested in actually digging into the, you know, a more, in a more in-depth manner about the cultural aspects of those regions. We do go there any chance we get of, you know, holidaying in there. Yeah, we'll talk about the food, the, you know, the, the, the amazing ways in which they cook meat and everything, but the sort of uh, cultural and religious aspects that you touched upon, not a lot of people would go, try to go and, you know, figure that aspect of that region. Uh, so just um, share, you know, what the storyboard of that those characters looked like when you started out. Yeah, so I don't have a storyboard, but I, um, you know, there's no plot or storyboard or outline. But like my first two books, this one did begin with an image, unlike The Geometry of God, uh, which was, you know, the voices and the first person telling. This one was a sensation and also a sound. Yeah. So I, I came across a series of photographs um, uh, by Ansel Adams, uh, American photographer who, you know, does natural landscapes in black and white. And there was one of, of Bridal Veil Fall. And, and I wrote the first line that I wrote in actually was this, it was the wrong moment to view Bridal Veil Fall, the sheer force of the torrent always making me weep. And I found myself wishing childishly if only the drop weren't so steep. This is the first line that I wrote and it just came to me that a day when I got some really bad news and I kept thinking of the waterfall and, and something about the waterfall and just sort of the force of it. Um, Nader's character began to form and specifically his work as a landscape photographer because that's what he does. Um, and then at some point, you know, from there, I moved to glaciers. Now I had traveled in, in these parts uh, long before I beginning this book. Um, and, and again, you know, what we're holding, the body remembers, right? And, and so what it remembers, it sort of reveals to you in, in over its own, over a period of time that, that you, that it tells, it lets you know. Um, so I think, that I was partly drawn from my own experience um, in these areas and in particular my experiences with glaciers in these areas. And in the book, the characters trek across a glacier to get to Lake Sefol Moluk in Kavan Valley. And that's, that's what I had done. And I remember when I was there, um, what struck me was the sheer physicality of the glacier, you know, the size, the slipperiness, we actually, did drive over a glacier that was melting on a jeep. Um, the slipperiness, the muddiness of footprints, jeep tracks, the crevices and knuckles and slopes and the sounds and all of these things, they were living inside me. And so when I was writing Nader's story as, you know, going to these areas as a landscape photographer, it, glaciers came to play a part. Um, and in terms of just yeah, coming back to the question of the natural world and our engagement with it in Pakistan, I think you're right that we, and just to backtrack a little bit, you know, you, you mentioned the, the indigenous story here is very important. And I actually looking back, think that I have always been interrogating the origins of our country, right? I mean, even in the geometry of God, the previous book, um, you know, when, when we're talking about fossils and we're talking about evolution and we're talking about transitions and transitional mammals, which was the dog wheel and it was comical, but it's also a way in which the characters see themselves, that they are, tr they are trying to make room for, for individual and cultural social growth and development within uh, a society that is very restricting, you know, that has a narrative of the birth of Pakistan. And, and so anything outside that narrative, um, it can become very uh, dangerous. And, and, and so I think I had been 
I have been carrying this, this need to interrogate these beginnings throughout my career as a writer. And, and in this book, um, I remember another time when I went to these areas, I actually passed some of those graves that I mentioned in the book and, um, and how, you know, how old they are and, and learning about animists in these parts. And I think maybe like Mariam, I'm partly an animist and I feel, you know, I feel at home in the physical world. And so it's not just an intellectual thing, writing, it's emotional, it's physical, it's sensorial. I write with my whole self, the, the body, the heart, all of it. Um, and if the geometry of God was set in the Salt Range Mountains and thinner than skin went higher to the Karakoram, the Himalayas, China, Central Asia, all these places that for centuries have been inhabited by nomadic tribes with the freedom to roam. Yeah. Long before this area was settled, yeah. you know, there was freedom to roam across borders, across state lines, and thinner than skin has a uh, Mariam's story is, of course, about this this ancient this tradition of being able to roam, and being deprived that freedom and and being uh, cajoled into settling more and more and giving up this way of life, mm -hmm. and that way of life also involved the freedom to pray, um, the freedom to pray in whatever way she had been. Her mother had been praying, and so her temples are kept hidden. Her her own uh, favorite, you know, sites where she would go for, for her own rituals, they were all kept hidden. Um, but these are still alive, Fatma, and these areas, this is what, you know, people find a way to preserve, even if they have to do it increasingly in fear and increasingly in secret, it doesn't go away. And so even and I think this is this is a hope in the book, even though it is a pretty dark book. This one, um, the fact that that these rituals are being preserved, even as there's increasing pressure to give them up, yeah. is something to be proud of, and something to celebrate, and something to be aware of, and something to support. And and so I feel like all of this was happening in the book, mm -hmm. and. The Northern Skin has elements of thriller, quest, myth, magic, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think some people have said that, you know, the, this book is actually the most plot driven because mm -hmm. there's that segment at the end when they're finally yeah. on side and there's the, I think I get a thrill just looking at those, those pages. Mm -hmm. You, um, so yeah, um, I do think that the part of my interest in writing these landscapes is to go back in time. And, and, and to go back in time means to, to look at the people who have been there long before our own family settled. My family came, you know, we're partitioned refugees. Mm -hmm. My father's family came from the Punjab. My mother's family came from UP, although they came from Hyderabad at the time, but my Nana was from UP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we came, quite recently, if you look at the long history of the land. Uh, and then when you talk about the long history of the land, you have to talk about these spiritual elements as well that existed, the, the religions that existed, pre-Islamic religions that existed. Mm -hmm. And along with this come these lovely stories of myth and magic. And there are no churails as such, but mm -hmm. one of the characters, Mariam, who's from a, you know, yeah. good nomadic tribe of the Kauhan Valley. Um, she has spiritual powers that she then turns to when her family, her freedom of worship and freedom of movement, they all come under threat. So I don't know if I answered your question, that was a slightly meandering answer, but I, I just want to say that there's this one line in the book that is probably my favorite line, which is uh, everything alive is in movement and everything that moves is alive. Yeah. And, and I, you know, these, these ways of worship are also part of that movement. And these ways of staying nomadic are also part of that movement. The wind, mm -hmm. the animals, the mountains, the mountain stories, the fairy stories, all of these things are alive. And um, I think that line might encapsulate my own relationship mm -hmm. to movement and to living things as well. Yeah, um, that the line that you read that is actually one of my favorite lines from the book as well. 
Um, and yeah, it, it, it again, um, like your other books, this too, again, has a very visual uh, element to it when it comes to, you know, landscapes. And that is something that sort of keeps uh, the reader engaged with the plot line. Uh, for me, this is one of the key aspects that uh, keeps you, you know, hooked to the storyline. Because for me, I, given that I also have an interest in, you know, uh, nature and landscape photography specifically, these visual uh, ways, not everybody, uh, when uh, if you read different writers, everybody has their own, you know, style of writing, but not every, not a lot of writers can actually go in this they can cover the superficial aspects of it to, you know, move the story along. But in your books, what I feel is that, you know, these natural elements are very much ingrained and make what, they're part of the core storytelling. So that, that's something that I really enjoy. And uh, speaking of, you know, uh, preserving the history and, yeah. you know, from where our country comes from or, you know, just tracing their steps. Uh, the first book that I actually read and, from where I started uh, basically following your work was No Me uh, And uh, you have, and I think I've, I've, re I've reviewed, have reviewed your book and we've talked about this uh, at other, on other platforms as well. So I won't uh, spend a lot of time going into the details of how you decided to you know, write this book because you have like pretty well explained it in the book itself, uh, how you ended up writing it. I would like to, uh, again, focus on the characters. Uh, mm -hmm. This is also uh, for all those who have uh, yet not read it, Nomi Ali uh, talks about, and specifically, I, I would like, uh, this is a good way to sort of uh, go towards the end of our conversation here is because these days, locally, there's a lot of debate about, you know, preserving our own culture and, you know, telling our younger generation about our history and, this is sort of something that's uh, making the news these days. So Nomi Ali talks about an aspect of our history that we have never been taught in schools. Uh, still with all the education reforms that have been talked about, this I haven't, I have yet to come across anybody saying that, oh, this is something that has been added to our uh, kids' uh, social sciences or history curriculum and, you know, it has opened our eyes or whatever. Uh, so yeah, uh, you discovered it in your own way. Uh, so maybe talk, uh, just touch upon it a little bit and then talk about the characters because as you have already explained that your writing process is more, it's, it has sort of a lot of elements. There's no structural thing that you have a story, always have a storyboard. It has all the visual sound aspects of it and then a story comes about. So yeah, this is something, uh, a historical fact that you discovered and then you thought that this was a book that you always wanted to write. Uh, mm -hmm. So just say, uh, share how each of the characters, not just that of Nomi Ali, but all the other various, uh, there are some very interesting female characters here. So just talk about them, how you decided to you know, portray uh, those characters uh, in the book. Okay. Yeah, so in terms of the you know, how I came about it. Yeah, I won't go into too much detail because that's been talked about in some other interviews and then yeah. in the acknowledgement section. But I'll just say very briefly that as, as you know, the book took over 26 years to complete. Um, and this means that though it's my fifth published novel, it's actually the first one I began. Yeah. Um, and it did begin, I'll say that with an accident. So I was, I had gone, this is when I was in Arizona, I was a graduate student and I was doing a, a history project on my history mm -hmm. and my South Asian history. And it was a completely different project. It was actually on something else that we don't need to go into. But uh, I went to the library to find a book for that project. And then I accidentally pulled this book off the shelf and I started flipping through it. And I found a reference to a British prison a, a prison paradise. And it was a quote by a British politician who described the Andaman Islands as a prisoner paradise. And I, of course, we know of Kalapani. Uh, that's about all I knew was that it was this dreaded place to which prisoners were sent 
but we weren't taught anything about yeah. the Andaman Islands in in our uh, schooling. I think the so, the only key reference to Kalapani for all of us is that we know that Bahadur Shah Zafar was sent to Kalapani. Right. Usse zada, yeah. I don't think ki uski, ki the what was that place. Uska zada, kisi ko bhi right. pata. Nothing. And and what you know, I also discovered. Is, is that women political prisoners were also sent there. Uh, women prisoners, women political prisoners. So I differentiate in the book between political prisoners or you know freedom fighters, however you want to label the British, of mm. course, call them terrorists, um, and ordinary prisoners. And and so the prisoner two one eight D, the woman in the book, it was my first fictional character ever for a novel. I mean, before that, as I we talked earlier, you know, I had been scribbling since I was a child. Um, but she was the first character who ever stayed in a novel to have been written. Um, and she, so she began, you know, in North America, and then I went to Morocco, and then I went to Pakistan. And everywhere I moved, she kept coming with me and she, her story kept evolving. Um, and I, and I was trying to find out more about the life of prisoners on these islands. I really wanted to just know the daily life, like what, what was it like, you know, what, but there was very little that I could get my hands on at the time. Um, and so I started creating her story mostly through letters. And as you know, uh, some, of the, some of the letters are still in the book, but they're not written by her. They're written by family members and friends to her. Uh, but the idea of of telling this book in part through letters was was always there. I, I, it started unraveling in this way, um, even though I didn't know the essential role that the this form was going to play. Um, so her story just kept expanding, and this took a very long time. Nomi came to me differently. The first chapter in the book now, uh, which is about the Japanese stealing chickens, is based on an actual event. So the story, just for those who don't know, there's a dual occupation, right? There's the, the freedom movement of the 1930s, which is when the prisoner, the woman prisoner in my book was involved in that, and she gets sent to the Andaman Islands. And then the islands are occupied by the Japanese during World War II. And this is also something that we were never taught. I didn't know that Japan actually occupied a part of India. No. Uh, I had heard stories about Chittagong being bombed. Yeah. You know, I had heard that, but it, it all sounded like it happened maybe for a few days or a few yeah. weeks. Bef and we of course know about Myanmar, Burma, that Burma, the, the occupation there was brutal and long lasting. But it all, there was this huge geographical vacuum between Malaysia and Burma, what happened? Yeah. And, and so it, it's interesting too, because um, when I learned about this, uh, this true event, which is that the first shot during the Japanese occupation of the Andaman Islands was fired because the Japanese were stealing chickens and a boy was trying to save one of those chickens. Um, I, I thought, well, wow, I mean, this is, isn't this just how history is? It's often triggered by something so small. And it's often the very small who threaten the biggest powers, right? Like what, and so Z is actually based on the actual character. Um, and Nomi is made up. And so, I don't know if, if the actual character had a sister like Nomi. I mean, I knew, I didn't learn that much about his family life, but I didn't really want to learn that much about his family life because I, once Nomi came to me as a, as a made up character, um, I wanted to just stay in the fiction part and I didn't want to get too buried in, in, the, in the history because then the facts start sort of becoming their own weight and I didn't want to, to worry about that so much. So it, it's always felt like that Nomi and the prisoner were kind of dual compass with the prisoner starting the book and, and Nomi completing it. Um, and then in the book, you know, their paths cross several times and every time it did, 
my heart would just, there would be excitement because I just knew even before completing the book that their meeting was important, that these two characters were, were working in tandem. Mm -hmm. And I hope for the reader, you know, those scenes will also resonate. But aside from Nomi and the prisoner, each character had its own genesis. And, you know, some changed a lot, like the prisoner kept evolving. Um, for instance, the character Shakuntala, uh, who is the one who is, does not come as a prisoner or as a child of a prisoner, but she comes as the, the wife of a, of, she's married to an, uh, a British official. Yeah. Um, so she comes to the islands very differently. Yeah. In earlier drafts, there was more of her past life in Chittagong. Yeah. Um, and then when I grew to understand her better on the islands, I trimmed those earlier parts and I, and I just wanted to focus on her story as, um, as someone on a, with a farm uh, on the islands. And I, and I did a, and I found out some interesting, you know, uh, material about farming on these islands. Um, and, and then, so she kept evolving as well, but then there are other characters who like Nomi just seem to, just seem to be fairly fully formed and didn't need much revision. Um, and curiously, the two main Japanese characters were like that too. So Susumu-san, who's the dentist, but who's actually a spy. Yeah. Um, I saw him in a flash on his bicycle and it, it's interesting that in uh, the Andaman and actually especially in the Kobar Islands, till today the, the bicycles that the Japanese left behind are still in, in use and bicycles are still a very popular form of public transportation. Mm -hmm. um, so even before I knew that I saw him riding a bicycle and I just thought well you know this man and his bicycle, that's, that's where I'm going. And so I started writing him like that. And it may have been that I lived in Japan as a child. Um, and though I've never been back since, it seemed to me that this character was strangely familiar. Mm. And um, yeah, it, you know, he, it, it, I lived in both England and Japan. So both the, the occupying powers mm. are and I have characters from both. I have English characters and I have Japanese characters and then I have Indian characters from across South Asia. That's something that my publisher, my Indian publisher, Karthika, who I mentioned earlier, she, when she read the book, she said that she hadn't read a South Asian writer writing about pre-partition India with the geographies of Pakistan, India and Bangladesh all present. So, you know, Shakuntala is from present-day Bangladesh, uh, Nomi Ali's family is from present-day Pakistan, and then there are other characters who are from India, and there's also a character, I, who's from uh, Myanmar back then, Burma, um, and all from across all faiths. So that is also something that I hadn't been um, consciously trying to do, but it's just the sprawl that felt very natural to the book, and perhaps also natural to my own long conversation about, you know, the origins of our country and, and, and the history that we were not taught. But I just also want to quickly say that the other character who I didn't have to revise very much was Dr. Mori. He's the other Japanese character in the book. Um, and, you know, the smell of his hair, the, that scene between him and Shakuntala where he's, he's walking her back to make her tea. Um, I don't know, that was very, that, that was uh, one of those, those moments of, you know, in a writer's life where you just, you're just walking with them and it's just very present. And I didn't have to revise him very much. And it may just be that there was something about these Japanese men that um, maybe I had interacted with characters like this, or it, it may just be that, um, there was something that that was still present in our own consciousness in Pakistan, you know, the way that that uh, that a lot of the men in our own families sort of have this very upright demeanor and very groomed um, and men who can outwardly be very well mannered. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they're not committing horrific crimes as, as well, 
and, and so that duality between him being extremely well-mannered and cultivated and having a very fine artistic sensibility, but also uh, doing something very cruel, um, that, that was very compelling to me. And so he seemed, he was very easy to write. Maybe it was a very familiar type. Okay, so um, we have covered all your five books. Uh, what are you working on right now? Any publishing news that you would like to share? And what else? Uh, when can we expect a new book? Uh, so exciting publishing news, which is that The Miraculous True History of Nomi Ali came out in Sweden last month. Um, and it's coming out in the US and the UK in April 2022. So I'm very happy about that after all these years that, you know, Nomi is finding multiple homes yeah. and is going out into the world and hopefully will be read. Um, in terms of what I'm working on right now, I feel like my, I'm still very much in this book. <laughs> it takes me a while, you know, after a novel and it's maybe especially this one because it took so long um, to take it, uh, I think it was Herman Melville who said, you know, book has to be taken off the brain. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's not just taking it off the brain, right? It's taking it off the bones. Um, it's still very much on my bones and, and I'm not able to, to really move away from it just yet. I am scribbling other things because I always do that. I don't know if they're going to become a book and I don't know when any of it will be published but it's still happening um so who knows there may be surprisingly quick news or it may take a long while again uh, we'll be looking forward to it um thank you so much for your time uh ever since i've like discovered your work this was something that i had in mind that at some point i will actually sit down with you to discuss all your books and I think uh, before the next one comes out, I have sort of accomplished that uh, sort of off my checklist. Uh, so hopefully I uh, would love to have you back on next day podcast whenever, whatever you come up with. And in the meanwhile as well, uh, hopefully we also do a book club series and we'll see if somebody wants to pick some book and then we can have a detailed uh, book club format session with one of your books again that would be lovely thank you so much Fatma. it's so fun to be able to talk about all five books uh with someone who's read well most of them yeah so i really appreciate i can't it. actually find the noble rod maybe it's because it's an older book and because we have like import uh, import books but uh, i i have my eyes out for it as soon as i find it i will that will be that okay. will be read. I like that you're reading me backwards. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, that's actually interesting. But that's how sort of I discovered your reading. Uh, so my, my, it has been sort of a backward uh, order. Uh, once again, thank you for your time and see you soon. Thank you.